The late great Miles Goodwin talks about his favorite era of April wine. It may surprise some of you, others maybe not. This is an interview with my old cohort, my old colleague and friend Steve Burgess on Rock History Music. This interview with Miles Goodwin and Steve Burgess is from March 29, 1988, as Miles was promoting his first solo album, simply titled Miles Goodwin. The album we're about to talk about is not a record that was necessarily well known in the U.S., because everyone, I think, would expect Miles Goodwin to say that Nature of the Beast was his favorite album. That was the biggest one. But he holds a special place for an album from 75, Stand Back, which featured Tonight is a Wonderful Time to Fall in Love, I Wouldn't Want to Lose Your Love, Jim Clench's Ooh, What a Night, Don't Push Me Around, Come Hear the Band, and a lot more. It was a classic album, and of course, everyone remembers the canon on the cover, which they brought on stage with them. A Moment in Time, the Stand Back album. With Steve Burgess on Rock History Music. That must have been. Uh, was that gratifying? Did it did it hurt the band uh, when? Man, you've been you've been making records that people remember. I mean, when people found out you were coming into the radio station, everybody's got their favorite. You know, mm -hmm. everybody starts talking about this, that, and the other April Wine song. And you had so many of those out before you ever got to uh, the big breakthrough in the U.S. Uh, was that was that the one of the sweetest points of the the career, or did it turn out to be a, a detriment? And the, did it cause more tension in the band? When no, you... no, no. We had a ball during those periods. See, when Brian Greenway joined in 1977, uh, we made an album called First Glance. We decided to toughen up, uh, refocus, and all that kind of stuff. That's why we called it First Glance. We had a brand new record deal on uh, Capitol Records, our first record for Capitol. And we had a song called Roller that broke us down there. All of a sudden, that following year, 12 month period, we were traveling a lot in the states opening up for a lot of big name people like journey and foreigner and all kinds of various people and then uh we went to england and recorded uh, the nature of the beast and uh just between you and me broke in the states top 40 and that record ended up selling a couple of million records and at that point we were able to tour as headliners all across the states back and forth a couple of times across canada a couple of times over to europe a couple of times we did a lot of touring from that album and those were real, those were a couple of very, you know, two or three sweet years. You know, we were finally out of Canada, being accepted as, a, as an international act, seeing the world. And um, it was very sweet. It was great. It was great. Now, and it continued for a while and it started to fall off until, until the um, demise of the group. But when I look back at the whole thing and I think about the best part of April Wine, that wasn't the best part for me at all. The best part was about 75, 76. Really? Yeah, it was stand back right in and around there. That's what I considered the the real fun part of April Wine because it was so young. We were all so young and so innocent, and we went in and uh, just did what we wanted. Um, recorded, we produced ourselves for the first time. Had a ball. A lot of great songs on that Stand Back album. First album to ever go platinum in this country. Then I went double platinum, five or six Juno award, uh, nominations that year, etc. And we were kids. We were kids. We were just having a ball. Just. Um, it was sensational, and later on, when when we when we had all that excess, it was fun, but it was in a different way. We were more mature, and all oh, it's about time. And and of course, there are clips on that solo album from 1988, the first album that Miles Goodwin ever released solo. Steve Burgess talks about some of the tracks with Miles Goodwin. Talking about uh, about this album, it uh, you did decide, as you were saying, you decided to go in a, in a pop rock vein. It's rock and roll. You've got some of the ballads on there too, but mm -hmm. uh, but it sounds like you went for a, a rock and roll album. But you didn't actually sit down and say, "I'm going to make a, a tough sounding album." Uh, I knew pretty much what I wanted. I wanted it to be um, very rhythmic. I was really interested in you know in, in making everything very rhythmic and, and very tight, and use all the uh, all the new stuff that's out there that I was listening to in April. What I would you know while in April one hearing it on the radio, saying, "Gee, I wish I could do that." And never being able to do it, you know, and um, so and Lance was very much into this. Uh, says, "Okay, Miles, this is this is it. Let's have fun with it, you know. Um, this is all the latest stuff. I didn't use a drummer, with the exception of one track. It was uh, the drum machines and a lot of programming and and programmers like John Caron who did all the Corey Hart stuff and people like that. And if you know what you're doing, it doesn't come off sounding real sterile. I think it comes off sounding real good. And I had a ball doing it, you know." What about the band, uh, the, the, the people that you used? Were these people that you'd been wanting to, to work with? No, I met them through uh, Lance Quinn, mm -hmm. all these people, yeah. Uh, he would suggest somebody and, you know, and uh, work with a lot of people. And finally, out of the group of people that I met, I picked five guys 
to be part of the band and I asked them would you like to come with me on the road and they all would like that very much and they're waiting for the phone to ring right now and what, what's the, the scoop with the tour uh, May plans? yeah is right? tour in May yeah and uh, is it going to be a, a tour of Canada first you're going to Canada first then down to the states and across the states mm -hmm. if all goes well yeah sort of states tour you're looking at maybe a, a club tour you're going to try and uh um, I don't know. Whatever, uh, whatever's out there. I mean, even in Canada, I don't know what it's going to be. Maybe in one city it'll be a club, in another city it'll be a uh, you know three thousand seat or somewhere else. It's going to be uh, more or less. I don't look forward to playing the clubs. I don't mind them under the right conditions. A showcase is fine with me. Uh, I don't mind playing small groups and small venues. Uh, the only offer that I've had, and we're not even looking for offers, was a phone call the other day to headline at uh, Ontario Place. And for a good deal of bucks, folks. So that's really nice. I'm really glad that somebody out there feels that I can still draw. Of course, that's not going to be uniform across the country. That's one example. I don't know what's going to happen. Did you put the gun on hold? You really? Uh, no, I said yes right there. Is that right? Oh yeah, I taped it too. I mean, I'll take him to court if he backs out. <laughs> Should, shouldn't be too eager. Put the gun on hold. Let him sweat for a moment. Uh, tell him we get Spielberg on the other. No, line. we told him we're thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> that's we'll the, think about it. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Miles Goodwin was not a Frank Sinatra fan. There's a song on the first solo album from 1988 called Frank Sinatra Can't Sing. And he tells an interesting story with Steve Burgess on Rocky Street Music. Talk more about the, the album. <laughs> Did you once think that Frank Sinatra could sing? <laughs> no, I've never really been a fan. Um, although, um, I was going to tell you a joke. I will tell you the joke. It's a very short joke, but I, this guy is saying that Frank Sinatra once saved my life. These two hoods were beating me up in an alley, and Frank said, that's enough. So he's a real nice guy, real kind-hearted guy. I don't know. Um, I guess he could sing. He's the original boss, you know. Um, the point of the whole song was just, a, you know, a statement on the way the social problems they, you know, caused by alcohol and drugs, cocaine, crack, mm -hmm. uh, the AIDS, the problem with AIDS and everything. Just a little statement on, you know, these all these problems and Sinatra's 70 or 70 plus and he really can't sing anymore. And that's an end of an era, and it's all too bad. It's a pity. That's what I'm saying. It's a shame. Okay. Sonia, who, who is uh, Jeff Paris? Jeff Paris is a Philadelphia songwriter, singer-songwriter. Mm -hmm. He's out now at Los Angeles now. A heck of a singer. Great singer. Great songwriter, too. Super, super. I don't know why he hasn't broken yet, but he's just amazing. And he had the song. It was called My Girl. And I remember the original My Girl. So I... Got, I asked him if I could change the names, and so we went from My Girl to Sonia. It's a ballad, you know, done Miles Goodwin style. I really like the song. It's a nice song. We'll have more from Miles Goodwin. Remember, if you want to see the entire interview, it's on our Canadian channel at Rock History Canada. There'll be links at the very top of the description. If you want to know more about Steve Burgess, it's all in the description. Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music. Music.